bus to lift off the ground. Greater engine power was needed to give them greater lift capacity to carry men, weapons and machines. In World War II, Germany found that power in the Fokker Achgelis FA223. It had a single 1,000 horsepower piston engine, powering a twin rotor system that measured 78 feet from tip to tip. The two rotors gave it enormous lift capacity. And with a max speed of 150 miles per hour and a ceiling of 23,000 feet, the FA223 wasn't a dragonfly, it was a dragon. Germany was very advanced in rotary wing development at the beginning of the Second World War and they developed the FA-223 as a transport type helicopter but also to carry heavy loads and they were actually used experimentally by the Alpine Regiment to move heavy artillery around in the Alps. Despite the FA-223's impressive performance, only a handful were made. For the Axis and Allied powers, helicopters were still a novelty. Even so, the FA-223 had given the world the first glimpse of the helicopter's true potential. The forward 10 years, and a new breed of lighter, faster, more maneuverable chopper began to appear. 1950, Korea. For the first time in its history, the American Army conducts a large-scale deployment of helicopters onto the battlefield. The Bell H-13 Sioux was a lightweight airframe powered by a 157 horsepower piston engine. Its agility and reliability meant it could provide close support in the roadless, mountainous terrain. Uh, this aircraft was very effective as a medevac uh, helicopter. For the first time in combat, uh, you could have a wounded soldier evacuated and back to a MASH or a field hospital in a matter of minutes, which saved countless lives. The Sioux's engine delivered enough power to lift two wounded soldiers on stretchers strapped to the outside of the airframe. In the course of the war, 23,000 troops were evacuated to MASH units in Korea, 18,000 of them by Sioux helicopters. The Sioux medevac had proved that vertical takeoff and landing was a lifesaver, but a lack of engine power was still limiting the chopper's wider potential. The H-13 basically limited what you could haul and where you could take it to. That's why we don't see large cargo carrying capacities on the aircraft. Really, a co-pilot and two stretchers was about the maximum that you were going to get out of it at, at a sea level condition. And the, the gross weight and the payload dropped off the higher you went in altitude. The Sioux's piston engine was literally weighing it down and holding it back. Here we have a typical radial piston engine that was used in the early helicopters, but very heavy, producing about 700 horsepower. And the problem, of course, with the helicopter is that you have to lift everything and carry it. So the weight of the engine is actually quite an important factor. Move on 10 years and that power had arrived. The piston engine had been replaced by a tougher, lighter engine, the jet turbine. And it delivered a massive 1,500 horsepower. The beauty of the turboshaft engine is that it's really a conventional jet engine at the front so that it sucks in the air, compresses it, mixes it with fuel. But instead of it being expelled out the back as a jet engine would, it actually drives some more blades which in turn are connected to a shaft. So it's a very simple, effective way of providing power for the helicopter. The turbine engine created a new breed of helicopter, the UH-1 Huey. The chopper was no longer limited to carrying a couple of wounded on external platforms. The Huey had a huge loading bay, which could carry 14 troops or 3,000 pounds of internal cargo. It could also transport howitzers, jeeps, and crash choppers with its underslung hook. Today, the turbine engine continues to deliver awesome power to the helicopter, making it the most powerful workhorse on the battlefield. Like the Huey in Vietnam, the Black Hawk brings frontline support as medevac and transporter. But with two 1,500 horsepower engines, the helicopter's grown some serious muscle. This is the interior cabin, and this is obviously where we carry troops and then internal loads. Right now, in this configuration, there's 11 seats. We do have the capability of taking the seats out just by snapping these snaps, storing them, and then we can actually put in 20 to 22 combat troops if that mission required. We can take all of these seats out and just 
pack everything up securely to the roof. Also, we have a feature down below where we have a cargo hook. If I hit the switch, it falls down, and that gives us the ability to do an external sling load. We can do that up to about 9,000 pounds. 9,000 pounds is a little bit heavier than a standard home V or a large truck. We are able to carry that with the power that we have in the Blackhawk. Power has transformed the helicopter. The CH-47 Chinook has two 5,000 horsepower engines and can carry 26,000 pounds or 55 troops. Power has given the helicopter awesome speed. A Westland Lynx can soar through the sky at 249 miles per hour. But most importantly, Power has given the helicopter the ability to carry weapons. If you're the average DC and you're hearing 10 M60s firing in your direction, your gut reaction is to dig a hole and get in. In the 21st century, vertical takeoff aircraft are capable of mounting precision surgical strikes. Bristling with cannons and missiles, they are the true terminators of the battlefield. We've got the capability to have a standoff range to where we can't even be heard. You've detected the enemy, confirmed it's a valid target. You start launching ordnance on the enemy. They've not heard a helicopter. They've not seen a helicopter. They've not made any contact with our forces. And the next thing they know, they have precision weapons raining down in their position. Go back to the Korean War, and helicopters didn't pack any kind of weapons. Choppers like the H-13 Su went into battle with their blades, their skids, and an attitude. And there are all kinds of stories about people throwing grenades out of the aircraft or using their sidearm to fire at targets on the ground. And this was all part of the, the basic evolution which uh, led to the arming of the aircraft. This evolution faced two problems. The first, how to engineer a combat helicopter. The biggest challenge was the extra weight weapons added to the airframe. Then came the breakthrough. They started adapting weapon systems to other utility helicopters, i.e. the UH-1, the Huey, which made a, a very good platform for, for a gunship. The Huey's turbine engines gave it vastly more power than previous airframes. Enough power to carry troops. Enough power to carry supplies. Enough power to carry weapons. The big question was, how would you use them in a combat role? The tactical solutions to this problem were evolved by Maverick General James Jumpin' Jim Gavin. The commander of 82nd Airborne in World War II, Gavin was a true visionary. He believed that the future of battlefield tactics lay in rapid deployment and rapid extraction. In 1954, his pamphlet, Cavalry and I Don't Mean Horses, called for the use of helicopters and giving the infantry close support. Nine years later, 15 Hueys were sent to Vietnam. Armed with two 30mm machine guns, the first helicopter gunships had arrived. But with all that power, they were soon armed with heavier caliber 60mm machine guns. On the ground, these bad boys served the infantry well. In the air, no change. We have a 600 round tray mounted to the gun mount and a 600 round tray in reserve. We carried about 2400 rounds of M60 ammunition. Choppers were officially armed and dangerous. In a country dominated by thick jungle, vertical takeoff and landing gave American troops close support and helped take the fight to the enemy. When you had a combat assault and you went in with full suppression, that meant you went in with 20 M60s firing. If you're the average VC and you're hearing 10 M60s firing in your direction, your gut reaction is to dig a hole and get in it, not raise up and shoot at those people. Unlike fixed-wing airframes, they could get close to the enemy, 50 feet, 100.